Morris Pichon, a co-producer of the Pacoima Today newsletter. We have with us here today Ms. Nicole Chase. She's a candidate for the seat of the 7th Council District. Ms. Chase, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Pichon. Uh, we asked uh, the people in the community what were they really interested in and, and, and what did they want to hear from the candidates. And one of them talked about the homelessness. How important, what did, did the candidates want to do to eliminate homelessness and what could be done with it to minimize or eliminate it? Um, <clears throat> that's actually, it's a huge, it didn't happen overnight, so it is a huge problem as we all know. And um, it is a big, it's a big issue item on all the candidates, if not most of the candidates. Um, and there's no one specific answer. Uh, and that's a sigh because it is such a huge issue. Um, I've always stated about wanting to provide more wraparound services uh, for those who are struggling, let's say in a position where they are struggling. And wraparound services might be, let's say, for family. Maybe it's some type of shelter, uh, maybe it's job development skills, even for an individual. But we also know that some need uh, mental health services while others need services to deal with addictions. Each area in the district, though we may have similar issues, are all combating the issue of homeless to one degree or another. Pocoima's, into Pocoima's uh, uh, challenge with homeless might be a little different from Sun and Tahunga um, and, and the other areas. And the race, this is the reason why I say that. Because in Pocoima, you, um, I, what I see, and I'll go from my perspective in terms of what I see, also as a stakeholder and a community member who's dealing with this issue, in Pacoima and the part of Silmar, where uh, the end of Silmar where I live, there's an issue of motor homes. And there's an issue more of families who are struggling with homeless, uh, um, the challenge with being homeless. Um, and in that particular instance, I think it's actually, if there is a shelter that provides a place for a family to have some level of stability with conditions, and I, I know that's kind of strong, but the condition is take advantage of the resources that are there. If it's, in, uh, if it's regarding skills training or skills development, taking advantage of those. If it's seeking out the resources that are being provided to you, leveraging those resources so that people see that yes, you are in a position of need to, you understand and value it, and you want to leverage it so that you can move forward. Okay. You have others though, that when we deal with the mental health issue, it's a little bit different. Not everybody wants to be taken out of the wash or taken out of where they are in hiding, us to say, or they cannot be found. Yeah. And we have to come up with a unique method in terms of how do we help these individuals to help, want to help themselves. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, sure. Okay, I got another question. We got a lot of questions. Okay. Um, how do you feel about the city? Um, Last November, had an issue on the ballot about raising uh, $1.2 million to actually house the homeless. One of the some of the citizens I've talked to, they want to know how, how will this work? Uh, they're, they're taking tax money and they're going to take and build houses for the homeless people. Now we can understand that, but when you got a home, you got an electric bill, you got all kind of utility bills. Uh, you got um, the chores of keeping it clean, keeping it health-wise, because nasty places is a nice is a nice environment for diseases. How do you feel about that? About how they're going to take and maintain this? You have any ideas or suggestions? That's actually my concern when it comes to bonds and measures. Um, when we put H H H on the ballot, yeah, um, and everybody was you know the whole the advertisement was to let's end homelessness. Let's let's solve the problem. But what I often see in terms of the laws that are initiated, they're band-aids. They yes. are pretty. The politician that put it on the ballot can celebrate and say, look what I did, vote me in. But when, when you peel back the onion, sorry, that's one of my favorite sayings. When you peel back the onion, you realize there's a whole lot more, which is yes. why. And how do we know this now? Because what's on the ballot now? H. Oh, right. that's because HHH -H -H was just for the structure. Six. Yeah. Okay. Now H is, oh, because we have to be able to pay for the services, uh -huh. and then what's next? H2, H4, I don't know. My issue with these types of ballots is we need to, before we start pushing issues down stakeholders or voters' throats, we need to look at the whole picture. 
if you are going to try and resolve an issue, then it should be this bond should cover the structure, the services, the staffing. It should have the conditions. We should need, we, we need to know where are you going to build these shelters? Where is the community's voice involved? There's a number, it's a huge dynamic that needs to be involved before it even hits the ballot. But that's why we're in the position that we're in now. So you're saying there's more questions than answers? There's far more questions than answers because homelessness, well, we know homelessness has been going on for decades. Ever. Ever. I, for example, there's a homeless, an annual homeless conference to eradicate poverty that was taking place every year for a number of years. I don't understand that because I remember going one year, and I won't say where it was, but I remember where I saw individuals who were in need of services that were in line around the building to get services while those who were coming to attend the poverty conference were going into a catered lunch. That doesn't make sense to me. I understand. Okay, or when you when you have you live in a community that has not only homelessness, but you have you have those who may barely have a roof over their head. So there's still in in there's still a poverty issue, but when we want to expose young people to leadership and things in this area, what do we do? We take them to go feed the homeless. So it's like we want to teach you about poverty. They know about poverty. Yeah, a lot of kids too. So it it it's something that we need to sit down as a community at a, at a round table. Not only as a community, but also with the stakeholders, the, the experts in certain areas. And we need to talk about how do we address these. As a matter of fact, we need to look at success stories. Are there any? A yeah, few. Exactly. So why are we not leveraging those conversations? Why are they not at the table to help us so we're not reinventing the wheel and just putting tax after tax after tax on the table for constituents to have to pay for it? and we don't know what we're paying for, and we don't know where they're going to build the shelters. There's a lot of issues we don't know about. Yes. But a lot of folks were interested in one issue. They say they, um, they called the city, 311 number, or even called the council's office, and request the pickup or elimination of trash in the streets of, of Bacoima. That's what I'm familiar with mostly. And they say it sits there for two or three weeks before the city get around to handle it. Do you have any solutions or any possible changes you can see that the city can improve their services to the community and improve our um, quality of life? Yes, and I'm about to get in trouble with you because the pictures you sent me two or three years ago, I hold on to those pictures. And you know why it's so sad that I hold on to those pictures? Because they're still there. Some of the same motorhomes on the same streets, it's still there. So we really can't talk about 311 because I know you call. So hmm. if that same problem, we have a problem, there's, there's an issue. So I can't say repeal 311 because I think 311 can be a very valuable tool if it is truly monitored, leveraged, implemented the way it was designed to be. But see, it's more than just a phone call. That means there needs to be local follow-up. So if that call 311 goes into the city, let's say downtown, then a record needs to come to the local office. The local office needs to follow up in three days. Now, that could be a huge burden, but we, we, there needs to be some follow-up. It doesn't make sense for an individual who we know, you know this area, okay? When you're making calls, and not only that, you know the system, you know the laws. When you're not getting a response, and the same problems taking place in the same area, there's something wrong and we need to take a look at that. I have to agree. So, and the other thing is, because I'll probably get in trouble for this too, you won't but, but Edwin's not here. Okay, good. So, one thing that I, I told the, t the people that I've been working with to develop my platform, I said, you know what, one thing my staff is not, is, is not going to know, they're not going to know where I am all the time. Because my plan is to hop in my regular hoopty, my little car, and I'm gonna be going through my community. Now, it's not going to be scheduled. They're not going to know where I'm going to go. But as I'm going through my community and I see things and I'm taking notes, I want to know how long has that been there? Because if I'm dialing 311 as a council person, I want to know, and if I'm being told that this is the third or fourth call, we have an issue. But I want to keep my staff on their toes. I want them to know that this is a regular part of their routine where they have to drive through the community and take note of what's taking place. Some individuals, uh they complain because they say um, when they call the council's, councilman's office or they call the city office 
about trash in the community, and it's, I called and it wasn't picked up. They said, well, we, it's always an alibi. It's almost like city employees serving alibis more than service. Uh, well, you know, we got a limited amount of workers. You know, we got budget problems. They've been saying that for 30 years that I know of. But the deal is, a lot of people are getting fed up with that because individuals got to pay the taxes on the home, taxes on the cars, property taxes, uh, all kinds of taxes. It may, it may be six, seven, eight different kinds of taxes. And they're tired of not getting service. And some people are embarrassed when they have family comes out, come out to visit from other arenas, maybe from Mission Hills, maybe from Sunland or someplace on North Hollywood. They say, why y'all got all that trash on the corner? Why? Because the, in the Seven Council District, they don't pick it up. In North Hollywood, they may pick it up. On Mission Hills, they may pick it up. But the deal is, people are embarrassed by living in a community where trash sit for weeks and months. What can be done about that? It's oh, hmm. you called it in, but it's still in. Well, there's there's another issue that we have to tackle in addition to just calling it in. Just like you said, you have people who said they're embarrassed. You have other people who may not be so embarrassed uh -huh. because so there needs to be, and if I have to say, there needs to be an educational process in terms of taking pride in your community. So if you're putting trash out you want to get rid of that mattress or that television, then there needs to attach to that address, no, let's not be anonymous here, I need so-and-so to come pick up, I'm getting rid of an old, te I'm getting rid of an old television or a mattress, I'd like to have it picked up. And that means the person that put it out there needs to take responsibility for it. Once the, the community starts truly leveraging its pride, and it, it might be street by street, it might be house by house, then that allows collectively with community, with council office, with other the city departments, we can tackle the problem together. But we have to address the issue of pride, and in order, to, and this has to be a, a coordinated effort because if we don't, we also the stigma that this is a dumping site. That's that's the stigma, that's a huge of stigma. Exactly. So if the people don't have pride in it and collectively we fight it, because once you take pride in something, if you see someone dumping something, you're going to be on the phone calling. Now let's get to the council office with regards to being responsive. My office will be responsive. One, I have a lot of people that I'm beholden to. A lot of folks who I've grown up with because I grew up in this community. So not only is it the individuals who call into the council, people, or the council office, I know folks who know how to find me. And if I am not living up to my commitment and dedication to the community, I'm going to be in a whole lot of hot water. And I know people can say, oh, that's being humorous. Oh, she's... No, but that's <laughs> a reality. That's a reality. I have, there are people who have known me for 30, 40 plus years here. And here I am saying I want to fight for the community, but if I'm winning as a, community, a council person, and let's say they're coming into the, the, you're driving through your community, you're like, Nicole, you've made a commitment to us. And now you're That's calling right. me on my home phone, so I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> what, why are you not keeping your commitment? So it goes back to bringing, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of the round table. You know, where we all come, there's no, I'm at the head of the table. Because we have to work on it together to leverage these service, the services, but we have to hold the departments accountable. Yeah. So easier and said than done, too. I, it I is. It's much easier said than done. Anyhow, uh, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to come and discuss this with us and no more. answer some questions. No, 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 Mr. Pichon. I can't ask them all. I'm limited. We oh. got the tape. You know, we got limitations. You know, we didn't have a, a motion picture studio here to do okay. this. Okay. But anyhow, uh, I'd like you to speak to the audience and. Okay, there's, you know, for, forgive me for asking. Go. Oh. Um, Forgive me for asking Mr. Pichon for more questions, and that's because I do want more questions. But I also understand that with a lot of these questions, there's no simple answer. And you will hear me say time and time again, it is about us working together collectively as a community to make sure that the laws that are currently on the books are leveraged, are, are, are handled, are, I'm, I'm losing the word that I want right now, um, but that we, if we have a law, that we apply that law. If there is a law or an issue that we don't like, then we come together as a community and say, how are we going to take this law off the books? It's not a matter of picking and choosing what we feel is right or wrong at that time. 
and then allowing others to get away with certain things. So there are issues that we have to address. The problem is this, CD7 has traditionally been neglected. We all know this. It's no longer going to be neglected with me as your next council person. It's about our community being respected. This is one of the most beautiful areas in the city of Los Angeles, the base of the foothills of the Angeles National Forest. Yes, I might say I'm on one end, I'm an equestrian. Two, I work for the Boys and Girls Club in Bacoy, and I live on the other side in Silmar. But I say this because I've had my hands in this community. I've been held accountable, whether it's working for a nonprofit, whether it's working in government, or just being a volunteer. And as your next council person, I want to truly leverage my experiences, both in the government, nonprofit, and corporate side, to uplift this community, but not by myself, but with you, the community. You will be with me the entire way. I won't be in front of you, we'll be side by side. And I ask for your support. Thank you.